Okay, well, we're very excited, actually, about uh, our commercial system performance in the two installations that we've got, one in the Philippines and uh, one in Lima, Peru. And most recently, actually, we, uh, we took 19 surgeons there uh, from, uh, from uh, Europe as well as from the United States, and they were able to perform uh, close to 200 procedures uh, over the last couple of weeks. And uh, we were very excited by the performance that we actually uh, received there. Uh, it really clearly confirmed uh, that our approach utilizing a two-piece uh, fluid-filled uh, non-corneal contact interface combined with 3D imaging, automated uh, biometric measurements, and a beam-guided delivery system uh, has supported our previous results in really being able to perform a complete fragmentation in low-grade cataracts where uh, we're actually able to virtually eliminate the use of the ultrasound uh, in, uh, in these cases. And in fact, in the, in the higher grade cataracts, we were su substantially reducing the CDE uh, to remove the cataract in the higher grade cataracts. And this also had a substantial impact uh, in those cases on lowering the FACO time uh, substantially in the removal of those cataracts. Um, and so uh, we're, we're very encouraged by, by that, particularly since we were taking users that had little or no experience in utilizing this technology previous. We also were doing a complete case in uh, approximately three minutes uh, from start to finish, including the docking time uh, in those cases. Um, the 3D imaging and the, the, uh, the, the beam guidance system uh, also uh, allowed us to achieve really near-perfect capsulorexis, um, not only in terms of the, uh, the size and the shape, but the location through the automated biometric system allowed us to place the capsulorexis on optical axis, uh, center of the, of the uh, cornea, or uh, our center of the pupil as well. So we were, we were quite encouraged uh, about, by that as well. Um, we believe that we're on the right track here as a result, and uh, that a lot of the issues that, uh, that uh, people uh, are, are working through uh, pertaining to lens tilt and its effect on, on uh, being able to perform the capsulotomy and the placement issues um, in this otherwise exciting technology that we're, we're addressing that uh, through the automated biometric system. Um, LENSAR uh, really has its roots. Uh, LENSAR stands for uh, Lens Accommodation Restoration. So our, our roots really lie in, uh, in the company began by working uh, into the crystalline lens uh, to try to deal uh, and, and uh, come up with a procedure to soften the nucleus of the lens in order to restore the accommodative effect. It still remains a, a, a strong project within the company. Uh, we've done uh, some human clinical trials on that, uh, having done almost 100 eyes and uh, following monkey eyes in terms of looking at uh, uh, cataract formation for uh, close to five years now without uh, any uh, progression of cataract. So um, we're, we're very excited about that. We believe that, uh, that this is uh, uh, something that we, that we really can, um, uh, can bring to fruition and something that we look forward to doing um, in, uh, over the next five years as we, uh, as we commercialize this technology for the cataract surgery. The other thing uh, that I think that we, can, we feel that we could have some significant impact in is that we believe with uh, our, our uh, beam guidance uh, delivery system and the algorithms that we're developing that uh, we do have the potential to uh, virtually eliminate uh, the ultrasound use uh, over time. And we've seen some very good evidence to that and we are uh, uh, reporting the data uh, across all cataract grades. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, Mark Forche Great. from Optimedica. Thanks, Roger. We've, uh, we've been working on this technology since 2005. I'm pleased to say we're now globally cleared uh, for capsulotomy fragmentation. And I may have seen a press release just in the last uh, week or so. We received CE clearance for uh, single plane, multi plane arcuate incisions um, in the cornea. We're quickly ramping our commercialization. We're now in three continents uh, in the world, uh, multiple systems in the United States. We've got systems in uh, uh, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, Australia, Dominican Republic. Um, we've now had more than 50 physicians utilize the system and we've done a, a, about a thousand commercial procedures. Um, you know, I think as, uh, to, to Roger's point, as you look at this new category, this is all about performance, all about the technology delivering. And we engineered in a number of really novel things to the system to deliver just to that. So beginning with uh, the graphic user interface to ensure you have a smooth, efficient workflow, pre-planning templates built in. Uh, our company is headquartered in Silicon Valley, so we better have a good graphic interface, and, and so we do. Uh, the patient interface, uh, the novel liquid optics, uh, provides a beautiful treatment path. 
uh, for the, for the uh, imaging of the lens as well as the treatment of the lens uh, with minimal IOP increase. Um, the onboard OCT is a really critical element because that identifies all the ocular surface structures and we automatically uh, place those with some sophisticated algorithms. And then, of course, the femtosecond laser, uh, state-of-the-art, very precise, uh, delivers beautiful cuts uh, as it's driven by the OCT. So, um, you know, you take all those things, and I think there's a synergistic outcome, and it's seen in the, in the clinical results. And maybe the, the best thing that I can speak to with that is uh, last week, Professor Burkhart Dick, one of our, uh, one of our customers, uh, presented his first 400 patients uh, in Korea and he saw some pretty remarkable things. He, he treated all comers. He had some very difficult to treat patient subsets uh, within that data. Uh, in that, that 400 patients, he reported 99% free floating capsulotomies. Uh, he also saw some amazing results with a reduction of effective phaco time. Uh, using our 500 micron grid pattern, uh, he saw a reduction of 96% uh, effect, uh, effective FACO time. And then when he used the 350, meaning asp uh, uh, segmenting into 350 micron easily aspiratable pukes, the performance was even better. Uh, so, you know, I think the overarching takeaway from this is this is remarkable technology. Uh, we still have a lot to learn and, and we'll learn a lot going forward, but it's an incredible foundation for the future. Uh, of, of taking us to new levels of precision, accuracy, and sophistication, and we're really excited about it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, next up is uh, Christian Hola for TechLS and TechFest. Yeah, <coughs> our company is uh, based in Munich, so our buoys might not be as good, <laughs> but our beer is better. <laughs> <laughs> I drink gin and tonic, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but probably doesn't matter in respect to the technology. <laughs> um, yeah, we are probably the last company hitting this market. We started about uh, one and a half years ago, or two years ago, with the cataract surgery. We have been in intracore where we tried to put in the femto laser into the cornea and to weaken the cornea at specific points to let get a little bit bulging forward. But okay, what we do right now is we have to develop a new system, the femto laser system, obviously, and it is um, designed to hit nearly everything in the eye. That's what we try to do. Uh, we go to the cornea as well as to the lens and beyond left and right, whatever you think. We try it at least. And so our system is definitely um, totally mm, controlled by software. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when, the, when we started to develop the system, we, since that time, we have finished the design, the mechanical electric design, by about half a year ago. And now we have um, rolled out about 15 systems. And we have not changed the hardware. It's only the software which we changed. We believe that this is, and, and now we have uh, 20 to 30 software engineers, because this is now the main uh, challenge for the company to hit with this high precision instrument the, uh, the eye wherever you like to do it. And we believe that there's a lot of things to do. So right now we have, um, we can do flaps, we can do rims, arcuate incisions, incisions, we have fragmentation. We think it's a, a multi-purpose system, which will allow the surgeon to really go uh, beyond the dreams where we are right now, beyond the thing, the thoughts. It's amazing that we think it's, it, uh, we think it's a way also to automa automatically do a lot of the procedure, so it will be faster, the procedure, it will be safer. We do flaps as well as uh, capsulotomies. So this, I think we have a, we believe that this technology is a very versatile uh, technology, which is mostly split by, um, by software. Look at the uh, laptops. The laptop stays the same, but you change the software. So that's, I think, what we, what, how we see the future. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, next, uh, Leonard Borman from AMO. Thanks, Roger. You know, Nick mentioned roots, and, and AMO's efforts in laser cataract surgery really started in our roots as well, too, and that's our technology uh, leadership position treating in the cornea. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have adap adapted our current software uh, to be able to produce uh, 
very precise, uh, reproducible arcuate incisions in the cornea. Uh, and at the uh, tail end of last year, we got CE mark for arcuate incisions, both penetrating as well as interstromal, and launched arcuate incisions in, in Europe and in other markets outside the US at the tail end of last year. I'm also happy to say that uh, we recently received 510K clearance for the same, and I'll be launching arcuate incisions here at this meeting as well, too. Uh, at the same time, we've been improving on our software so that uh, surgeons can deliver those incisions in a very precise, customized manner to develop entry incisions for the cataract surgery procedure as well. Now, at the tail end of last year, uh, while we were focusing on the cornea, we were also looking at certain enabling technologies that could be built into the system to allow us to deliver femtosecond pulses in an accurate manner deeper into the eye. Uh, and, and as such, we developed a new optomechanical delivery system. Uh, we also uh, developed a new technology for range finding uh, that allows us to reference all of the surfaces necessary within the eye to do laser cataract surgery without the inclusion of an expensive imaging system. Uh, and also one of the other pieces to this is stabilizing the eye and a new patient interface to be able to do so in a safe, reliable, and reproducible manner. And that all culminated in our first clinical trial to validate these key core technologies uh, with the help of Dr. Kevin Waltz and Dr. Marco Fajardo down in Honduras. Uh, in December, we treated our first 19 patients. And we produced 19 perfect, round, circular, high quality capsule rexes without the use of an imaging system uh, with about a tenth the energy of other systems today. And so, so our goal in this is now to take those enabling technologies, to build them into a system that can be provided in a cost-effective manner, not only to treat the premium patients, but all patients in all markets throughout the world. And like the others, we're really bullish on the, on the uh, laser cataract market. Uh, and we believe that with uh, the efforts of all of us together, we're going to end up creating a new standard of care much like Roger uh, mentioned with FACO some 30 to 40 years ago. Thank you, Leonard. And now, uh, last and certainly not least, uh, Ron Kurtz for Lensix. Uh, well, thank you. Um, I'll start off with a status report. Uh, as many of you know, we uh, commercialized the Alcon <coughs> Lensix laser just over a year ago. Since that time, we've installed um, over 120 systems in over 30 countries trained uh, over 500 surgeons and have performed uh, beyond 25,000 cases. Uh, the experience, we've learned a lot from the experience and uh, uh, as Christian mentioned, this is going to be a rapidly evolving field. It's, we uh, continue to iterate the technology. It's very flexible in that regard and um, many of the uh, design uh, uh, considerations that uh, others have tried. There are uh, a number of ways to get to different, to, to get to the excellent clinical results, and I think we are delivering that on a daily basis. Um, from a, uh, you know, from a clinical perspective, I think the important thing that, uh, and this was outlined in Jack's talk and also in Roger's talk, is, you know, why are we doing this? And at the end of the day, the reason has to be better refractive outcomes. Uh, and the two keys to that are, uh, as Jack mentioned, effective lens position, control, being able to predictably deliver effective lens position. We now have data that will be presented at this meeting with a uh, six-month follow-up that uh, shows that, in fact, that is the case uh, and that that results in a more predictable refractive outcome for spherical uh, outcomes. And then for the other piece for that is uh, addressing low levels of astigmatism, corneal astigmatism that exist in over 70% of patients who undergo cataract surgery. And there again, uh, the technology has been developed uh, to uh, deliver very effective astig astigmatic control uh, through arcuate incisions and uh, adjustable corneal incisions. And again, we're seeing the same results, very effective uh, reduction of residual astigmatism and that, in fact, is um, the, uh, one of the biggest drivers of utilization. And there'll be data uh, on that as well presented at this meeting. So all in all, the experience, uh, I think, validates uh, many of the things that uh, have been talked about today. 
Uh, the future is going to be, uh, you know, obviously some continued technology evolution. Um, we're still in the, uh, in the early phase of this technology, but uh, we're learning a lot very rapidly. And uh, I think that as we move forward, it's going to be uh, putting this technology in the context that Jack nicely laid out for us in, uh, in the total cataract procedure, delivering again the best outcome for patients. Thank you, Ron. Well, in the three and a half minutes we have left on this uh, panel, which isn't much, I'm going to ask each of you to very quickly uh, look into your crystal balls. Tell me when the inflection point is going to occur. When is this technology going to really start to become, enter into the mainstream, and what will trigger that inflection point? Uh, so maybe let's go in reverse order quickly. We'll start with Ron and then go across the other direction. Well, you know, first people have to have um, access to the technology. So, you know, currently there, there are just, um, uh, you know, minority of surgical centers that have this technology, but that's changing and we're already seeing uh, second and third systems going into geographic regions. And when that happens, uh, you know, you start to build in with that geographic region, you start to build the knowledge base both in the professional community but also in the patient community. So I think that that, you know, when you have multiple uh, sites within a geographic area performing, having success with the technology, um, that'll, you know, that'll uh, lead to the tipping point. And when will that be? Well, at this rate, pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, any yes on? Um, I think it really depends on the reimbursement. I think that um, if the ophthalmologists can make money, it will drive the market very strongly in this direction. Um, the technology is there to make it cheaper, to make it more reliable. It really depends on the reimbursement, which is different from country to country worldwide. And this is that might be a problem. In the U.S. it's different than in Europe and Germany. So I, it's driven by money. Mark? You know, I, th I think back to the moment that was uh, really critical to me, and it was uh, the seeing is believing moment. I remember the first time I saw a procedure, and I was just simply stunned at, uh, at how different it was and how rapidly you start to feel that every case has to be done that way. I also remember the first time I saw uh, you know, a, a really dense cataract removed with no ultrasound imaging. And so I think it's really contingent upon us to make sure that people have the opportunity to see those, uh, to see either through great education efforts, through videos, through, uh, now there's many sites that uh, you can take a look at uh, the technology with. And I see, I, I think that is a key inflection point. And, and uh, uh, that in addition to the others here that have been mentioned. I guess so. I don't know what's left after access, economics, and technology. Uh, but uh, I think it's ultimately going to be faster, I hope, than Seiko. Uh, Roger, you lived through that. Um, but, but I do believe that uh, I'm on the side with, with Christian. I think in, in taking a global approach to this, the, the economics of the system and the uh, economics to both the practitioner and the payers really are going to drive a true inflection point, I, I think. Uh, as Ron said, access is going to be a first inflection point, and Ron lived through the interlace uh, curve as well, too. Uh, but uh, but I, tr I think the true inflection point comes when uh, you can expand the access beyond the premium patients into all cataract patients. Nick? <laughs> I, I think everyone's pretty much said it. I, I, part of it is, uh, I think also, you know, there needs to be some competition. You know, I think uh, you know physicians uh, need choices of different technology. People adapt to uh, to different things different differently. Uh, we have a lot of different cars out there. People drive things that are that are different. I think, you know, getting uh, you know the other companies uh, like us out there where uh, people can see uh, you know how how these things treat, seeing the excitement of uh, I would agree with Mark, seeing the excitement that the surgeons had the first time that they used it, and to be able to see where it it really did affect. Uh, their ability to uh, to remove the cataract, uh, number one, and number two, I think to see the perfect capsulorexis, uh, you know, really gave people, a, a, you know, a lot of thought that this would also drive, uh, you know, intraocular lens, novel intraocular lens design, because certainly we have the ability through the software to change not only the shape, but a lot of things as it relates to the rexis. So, you know, I think we just need to get more systems out there and uh, and people see the results and how it performs. The economics usually tend to work themselves out over time 
uh, when, uh, when, when people have a technology that's, that's worthwhile where they see that, uh, that the outcomes are improved significantly. All right, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we could go on for hours and days on this, and we will in the future meeting at ASRS. But uh, I'd like to thank our panel for their uh, insights and thoughts.